Hello and welcome to the Psych Summaries podcast. My name is Hannah and I will be having conversations with clinicians, academics and experts that have applications to the field of psychology and mental health. They have many years of experience, meaning they are trusted voices in niche subjects. But I invite you to consume the content with a critical perspective, since a one-size-fits-all approach rarely applies to mental health. I hope you learn something and enjoy listening. Today I get to chat to the wonderful Dr. Han Wren, who specialises in anxiety, perfectionism and developmental trauma. However, her online presence is very much centred around BIPOC mental health, liberation psychology and anti-oppressive practice. So therefore a lot of her work is on the intersection of politics and mental health. I am so grateful that I got to have this conversation and I really hope that you take away as much as I did. So without further ado, welcome. I am so excited to chat to you today and I would really love if you could start with a little background for the listeners. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Han Ren. I'm a licensed psychologist and a licensed specialist in school psychology based out of Austin, Texas in the States. I started off in child psychology and, you know, that's what I have my doctorate in. But then when I started my own practice, I was mothering two young children and (laughs) realized I couldn't do it all day at work and then come home and have energy left for my children. But at the same time, I also realized that there was such a need, especially in Austin, for BIPOC mental health, BIPOC therapists. I started my practice in 2017, so it was right after Trump was inaugurated. And there was this tension in the air, especially with communities of color, of you know, fear and worry that, you know, existential fear and worry that their their needs and their rights are not going to be respected or represented. So a lot of people's mental health worsened at that time, and people really wanted to seek culturally affirming care. And I realized this is this is where it's at, you know, especially for me personally, being able to use my own experiences as, you know, a child of immigrant and a third culture kid and an Asian American to really support my clients in their journeys. For anyone listening that isn't quite sure what that term means, we're talking about Black, Indigenous and people of colour. Are people from these communities more likely to be missed in treatment, undersupported in therapy, or less likely or more likely to be diagnosed with mental health problems? Oh, gosh, it's such a big question. And I think, you know, there's a lot of chicken or the egg, you know, we know that there's disparities in how BIPOC are treated in the medical system. And there's also lots of differences in terms of stigma and, you know, how different cultures handle mental health and mental illness. And so I I don't think we have, you know, like definitive data that says like one group suffers more than the other, but we do have data around like which groups seek mental health care. And by and large in the U S people of color seek mental health care a lot less than white people. It's, you know, especially in communities of color, this idea of like, oh, mental health and therapy is a white people thing. We handle things within our own families and within our own communities or within the church. There's different approaches to mental health. And, and, you know, Asian Americans especially are the least likely to seek mental health services. I think we can be pretty confident that there are disparities in how people are treated, though, you know, when when we talk about issues of systemic oppression, and the trauma of immigration, and just like, history of like, global colonization, imperialism, there, these are absolutely like, systems of power and oppression that, you know, that oppress people in disproportional ways. And so, of course, people who have been subjugated historically are going to have more, you know, mental health and just like all sorts of physical health problems as well. And then when you think of that from kind of a generational trauma perspective and you look at you know the history of in chattel enslavement in the U.S., like it makes sense that we have just groups of people who suffer more across the board. 
these are the systems that we are living in and how do we support people who exist in these systems and it is very much chicken or the egg. Do you think that if there was more representation in the psychological or therapeutic community there would be um, more of an uptake in those BIPOC communities or do you think that it is a cultural difference in that they go to other means first i.e their families and other networks before they would seek the help? I mean, I think it's both, but I think first, you know, the destigmatizing mental health care for communities of color is a huge element, you know, as that like we can spread information or that this is helpful and accessible. And there are people who are, you know, adequately trained and culturally affirming and able to meet your mental health needs in a, in a way that feels accessible and safe. And a lot of that comes with shared lived experiences. So we have such low representations of clinicians of color in the US. You know, it's something like four or 5% of psychologists are Asian, Black, or Latin. And so because of that, like people who are come from communities of colors and might have, you know, medical mistrust or cultural mistrust of white clinicians because of their, you know, lived experiences of oppression or, you know, being tossed aside in, you know, other therapeutic environments or even medical environments, they're much more likely to resonate with um, clinician of color. And so part of it is how do we recruit and train up more licensed professionals of color? How do we address gatekeeping in academia so that more qualified therapists of color can even, you know, access the training that they need in order to better serve their communities? And then I think, you know, the second half of that is destigmatizing mental health, you know, from cultural frameworks. Like there is there's a lot of shame in a lot of these communities that this isn't this isn't what we do. But but mental health extends to everybody. Um, mental illness extends to everybody. And I, I also think that, you know, especially in communities of color, there's an idea like, okay, well, we go to a therapist because like, we have to because it's court ordered, or because we're like, so crazy that, you know, so sick, that we need this professional help. And th- so this like, idea of like the worried well people who just go and get support even if they're not going through a crisis that's not talked about as much and it's not normalized but that's also such a necessary part of destigmatizing and making you know good quality care more accessible to everybody yeah no I totally agree I think that is absolutely shocking that it's four to five percent that is four percent you know Asians four percent Black, you know, so like 15%, but still like 85% of clinicians, of psychologists, especially in the US are white. Yeah. And that's a failure. I've seen you talk about liberation psychology, and I would love for you to explain that term and why it is so important. Yeah. So liberation psychology is psychology for the oppressed by the oppressed. It is a way to conceptualize mental health and just psychological functioning based on the power and systems and structures that exist within society. It takes into account how um, differentials in systems of power affect one's mental health. And it's very much, you know, a kind of a a, a grassroots bottom up type of approach where, um, you know, it is designed by people who have experienced systems of oppression. It really like came about in Central and South America, and it's just gaining traction everywhere as we kind of use this framework to deconstruct and dismantle Western psychology as we know it. So this idea of like decolonizing or, you know, practicing from a decolonial framework when we when we address and talk about mental health. So it's really you know, sort of not just like, okay, how do we treat the symptoms? And how do we help you to, you know, take care of yourself and cope better? But how do we address the systems and dismantle systems so we can reimagine ones that don't manufacture trauma, that don't, you know, have inherent inequities built in to the system? That's, that's just sort of a, a, you know, simple definition of it. And I think, you know, translating that is really where it gets 
you know, interesting and juicy because as much as we'd love to like just abolish everything and live in different systems, we, we can't, we, this, this is the system that we exist in. And so applying these kind of decolonial liberation frameworks to our current systems and mental health treatment is really where I have spent a lot of, you know, my, my passion and, and, and energy and in, in trying like, how do we adapt this so that we can help people take care of themselves and each other and thrive within the frameworks that we have while we also kind of re-envision new and, you know, reimagine systems that have community care and that just like function better without so much inequity. I'm just thinking back to a post that you put up about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how actually it's potentially, well, highly likely that it's not representative of most people. But yet these are theories that we're taught in education and we apply to the masses. How do we <laughs> overcome this? Yeah. You know, it's obviously such a big question. Also, on a side note, how can people that aren't part of these BIPOC communities be of help? Because you mm. obviously don't want to be talking on behalf of those communities, but you want sure. to be helping out in any way that you possibly can. I think of it as just like multiple streams, like multiple parallel streams. You know, we got to start here and everywhere. And there's, you know, different approaches that, you know, we might take depending on which system and starting place we're looking at, you know, in terms of like academia, like there's so much gatekeeping within academia. And so how do we recruit and retain more you know, professors of color who can change the system from within advocate and also feel empowered and safe to be able to change the status quo. Anytime, you know, people are trying to change systems, there's a lot of backlash and fragility and defensiveness. And that's a lot to ask for one person to do, or, you know, just a few people to do. So it's like, not just like, well, how do we like put diversity in? How do we take the white supremacy out? How do we be really upfront and intentional about what are the standards that we're looking at when we're recruiting grad students and what are these like professionalism metrics that like don't actually need to be there how can we take into account lived experiences as just as important as like GPA for example and so you know from from an academic research perspective I think it is important that we examine our gatekeeping practices and you know make sure we amplify and elevate people in power who are people of color and and I think you know in terms of practice how do we make sure that you know we we can train more culturally humble and culturally affirming clinicians who not only like help you from this diversity and inclusion perspective, but like how can they do the work within themselves so they can be anti-oppressive and liberatory in their frameworks, you know, in terms of dismantling their own internalized white supremacy and internalized oppression, whether you are a person of color or, you know, a, a white person. I truly believe that, you know, as much as we want to just believe like, oh, let's, let's do all this stuff like out there. It's all out there. It, it's all within us. We each carry these ideas within the way that we live our lives and the way that we interact with the world around us. And so we have to dismantle our own assumptions in order for this to spread out. You know, when we talk about racism and anti-racism training, a lot of times it's like, oh, well, it doesn't happen in here or like in our organization. It's like something that we're going to go out into the world and, you know, do good in. But that misses the point because white supremacy is water. It's everywhere. You know, it's, it's the water we swim in. And so in order to have this change, you know, spread outwards, we have to start within ourselves. Each of us have our own implicit biases and internalized white supremacy cultural values. And so being able to identify what they are, notice it when they come up and have practice in doing that. This is not something you do one and done. This is, you know, you got to do the reps. Like you have to really notice and grow more comfortable with being uncomfortable and, you know, catching that within ourselves in order to spread this outward yeah and when when you're talking it, what really springs to mind is the kind of need for a like-minded community because it's very mm -hmm. difficult isn't it to be critical or 
pick up on every small kind of bias that you have you almost need people to also pull you out on it in a very in a gentle way because it's all well and good reading a book but then you want to put it into practice and you're going to get it wrong like you say there's going to be part parts where you get it wrong and and having people implement that as well but just quickly when you refer to white supremacy could you clarify what that means right now because I think a lot of people associate it with a kind of historical context but actually it's very prominent now and often not very obvious yeah yeah so white supremacy as an ideology not as a hate group is something that's pretty pervasive these white supremacy cultural values that we base our understanding of like human operations on like this is the best way the right way the only way some examples are you know a sense of urgency worship of the written word timeliness as professionalism idea of objectivity in anything i mean everything has bias even science perfectionism these are all cultural values that we uphold, you know, within ourselves and each other. And we, you know, kind of put it under this umbrella of like, this is, this is what professionalism looks like, or this is how we should be carrying ourselves. But it omits the, the gifts and stories and, and value of people who don't operate from these standards. And it, whitewashes and kind of flattens different ways of of being you know to uphold one standard way it's it's also just it bleeds into the ways that we interact with each other and ourselves when we say like well this is like the best way or like this is my ideal and I think you know that's going back to this like the research question like yes research is important because we that's how we validate and um you know really are able to translate things into like, okay, this, this can show that it works. But, you know, if we only go from that perspective as like this idea of objectivity, which is a white supremacy cultural value, we miss the richness and the nuance in practices that are indigenous and and ancestral that have been, you know, around for generations. We, you know, like neglect these things until we are able to like validate them. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I discovered it. You know, look at this. It's, science has proven that this works when like these communities who have been practicing them for ever have always known that it works. So it's just really like checking our own biases about where are we giving our attention and what are the values and ideas that we hold to be true. All of these things that you've just said, I would not have associated with white supremacy. I know that within the science world, there's much more of an emphasis on scientific methods, less so on kind of, you know, the interviews and the more, the richer data, Mm -hmm. etc. And you are right, you miss so much in that. And it, it almost like simplifies everything. But I would never, ever have thought that that was rooted in white supremacy so it's just so important to talk and hear about this because it really makes you check yourself Mm -hmm. so could you just tell us more about these scholars what do we need to know so the scholars who came up with this originally in 99 are, are Kenneth Jones and Tima Okun and they recently came up with this new website it's white supremacy culture.info and it really outlines the specific cultural values that they have tied to white supremacy. You know, so some of the other other qualities, you know, that are covered is the defensiveness, individualism, the right to comfort, protectionism, perfectionism, fear of open conflict, progress is bigger and more, uh, power hoarding, quantity over quality either or thinking, paternalism, knowing that, you know, I know what's right and best for you. So all of these are white supremacy cultural values that very much gets transmitted in our ideas of what professionalism looks like, especially in the workplace and within organizations. And, you know, people who are, who play by these roles tend to do better. These are systems that are designed to keep the powerful empower, oppress and suppress 
dissent and the you know, people who don't have power, which tend to be people of color. Mm. And the individualism one is one that I've, I've really, I'm struck by. I mean, mental health can't be an individual thing. You know, you are who you are mentally because of the way that you perceive and engage in your world. I think when we talk about mental health, a lot of times we start to talk about psychology, like the individual traits, characteristics, coping styles, you know, attachment, trauma, you know, all of that. But really, like mental health is related to economic health, environmental justice, uh, you know, policy. Mental health is related to community health and collective health. You know, the, the stronger and the more connected we are to each other, the better we all do. And so we cannot, you know, cure or like uplift what one person's mental health for, without also taking into account the systems in which they live and work and share with, with others. And so we, we really do have to take into account like, social support and social connections and, and also like what are the disparities and the you know systems of oppression that each community is going through and how can we remove those barriers um, from a structural collective level and like COVID is a great example you know when, when we talk about you know like people who are anti-maskers they tend to be pretty conservative you know, individual right to freedom, people who care less about the collective, the the, the greater good um, beyond themselves. And that absolutely is killing us. That's toxic. And that's toxic on a, you know, viral physical health level, as well as, you know, what this does to us on a mental health level, like this idea that we don't need anyone else but ourselves, pull each other or pull ourselves up from the bootstraps. But I mean, that is such a privilege laden way to approach and look at mental health mental health then is political right absolutely yes it's so political the personal is political you know mm. you go to a therapist and you are struggling with depression and anxiety and it's because gosh the gun laws in your state says that anyone can carry a gun anywhere and we just had another mass shooting this weekend in austin where 14 people were injured just like going to the bars and you know this barely got any traction or news because it's so normalized you know but like that that underlying anxiety permeates everything you know anytime I go anywhere I'm like where are my exit where, where can I hide you know are my kids safe that I mean that's a personal mental health thing but it impacts all of us and that is a policy that is a a, a, a political decision when people are elevating gun rights over you know individual safety I mean I guess they think it's to protect individual safety but you know we can't even do research on it in the u.s because it's not even allowed right like that is that is one example but also like if you hold marginalized identities if you are you know a trans person of color and you don't even know which bathroom you can go into of course that's going to make you feel anxious and you don't you don't know if you're going to be protected at your job if your identity and you know who you love and how you feel your best expression of self to be authentic is going to be extinguished, right? You're going to lose your job. You're going to be fired. You, people cannot hire you and you can't get married or, or whatever. Like these are personal decisions that trickle down from political and policy decisions. You know, this absolutely is personal, is absolutely political. Yeah. And, you know, mental health is mental health problems or mental illness is widespread but as we said right at the beginning of this conversation those in those BIPOC communities are even less likely to seek that help so you just can't comprehend it's hard you know society is hard for everyone and you know white people will say oh I'm really struggling and I you can't even comprehend that example of being a person of colour who might be trans and is also scared of the gun laws it's like there's just so much to be anxious about and it's yeah, absolutely it's it's a failed system which is obviously such an extreme statement to make but it's so sad and just 
a shame. So do you think, I guess, to try and lighten the mood, do you think that we are heading towards change? Are you hopeful that things can change? Are you seeing in practice, in therapeutic practice or uh, research or in a clinical setting, are you seeing changes? I'm hopeful. Uh, I know change is slow and there's a gap between theory and practice. But I I am hopeful because, you know, even with the amount of terrible things that have happened in the last year, we are growing in our awareness of that this is real and exists and these disparities absolutely affect health outcomes. And we are growing in our our ability to handle the discussion comfort that, you know, rise up within ourselves when we talk about these things. There's a lot of, that's like one other, you know, white supremacy cultural value, this right to comfort. People are like, oh, no, no, let's not talk about it. Let's talk about happy things as if that just makes these problems go away. It's out of sight, out of mind for people who are not living and affected by this every single day. And so I think building this awareness and and helping people really acknowledge and you know, be motivated to want to address this for, you know, greater equity and liberation of everybody that I think we are gaining traction in that. But you know, these conversations need to be ongoing. This can't be, you know, oh, it's Black History Month. Okay, you go talk or like, it's Asian Pacific History Month. You know, this is not a one month out of the year thing, you know, like, here, it's Pride Month, but like, we should be talking about, you know, LGBTQ issues, all year round, just like we should be talking about black people and Asian people. And like, you know, all of these experiences cannot be relegated to like one month. This is, this is a, you know, existential issue for so many humans and it needs to be centered all year round. Yeah. These are people's lives. It's not, yeah. it's not just something that can just gain short-term traction it's not a trend and I think you know the mental health sphere often falls into that trap most of the time people have really good intentions but I think going back to the question I asked earlier it's it's so important to expand your network and ensure that people are picking you up when you make mistakes and ensuring that you're inclusive and I think it's it's just a shame that in 2021, we are still talking about this. I worry about those potentially relying more on very, very poor media outlets to gain an understanding of this subject because it's so inherently biased. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, you know, so the further we get in like, in, you know, enhancing and and having these dialogues the more like pushback there there is you know from an individual and policy level you know in the U.S. there's a huge um, pushback right now against critical race theory as you know a valid framework to examine the history of the U.S. and they're saying you know we let's not teach this in schools and this is not actually how history has been done historically you know which is a a, I think a, a gross misunderstanding of history. I mean, history evolves. It's shaped and changed by the people who live it. And, you know, we, we rewrite our understanding of history with more information and different perspectives. And there's, of course, you know, this pushback against wanting to evolve in that way, become more and more, you know, fundamentalist or conservative or traditionalist as as you know these dialogues are expanding so it's just it's polarized and you know that's that's a really difficult gap to bridge to bring it back to psychology my last question to you is if you are someone who is very interested in the science research psychology if you are looking at research itself is there certain areas of research that you can take a critical approach to this area? What part of the research do we need to be looking at to understand whether it's representative, biased, and all of these things? Do we need to look at the samples? Is research honest about that? Yeah, I mean, I think 
you know, first of all, looking at the sample is a great place to start. You know, who were these studies done with, done on? Are, are they expecting, you know, white undergraduate males to be representative of the entire human experience? I think that's essential. And then, you know, in, in addition to effectiveness or efficacy studies where there's like, does this work, yes or no, randomly controlled trials, let's look at dissemination and effectiveness studies. How how does this translate in the community? When we teach practitioners to use this new model, is, is their data and the results as robust as it was in this like control for everything clinical trial? And, you know, and then also like looking at the stories, like doing, you know, more mixed methods types of studies or like looking at the qualitative, you know, grounded theory research, like what is what is what are the themes and patterns that we can gather from people's stories and lived experiences and you know doing like you know extracting data that way and just really trying to promote and allow for different types of studies and and you know just teaching research literacy which i think most people don't know how to do right they just look at the headlines like oh yeah but you know i think it's really important that like we you know, learn that in, in college, like, you know, without a, a graduate degree, like, how do you go to a primary source and read it and, and, you know, find the shortcomings in this and the generalizability of these different studies? And how, how replicable are they? You know, that's a big problem in psychology is that we are not finding a lot of these studies to have the same outcomes when we replicate them. And also like who's doing the research? That's that's another huge problem. You know, like if even if you have a very diverse sample, if all of the researchers who are designing these studies are are white and upper middle class, we're going to have um dis- differences and disparities and like are we even asking the right questions? So I think there's there's just a lot of work to be done in in all of these domains. Honestly, I totally agree. My frustration towards the exact same thing about reading a headline and Mm -hmm. or even the headline of a research paper and then not actually looking at the limitations of that research Mm -hmm. paper or like you say, whether it's been replicated elsewhere. It's it's so infuriating. I just want to say thank you so much for being such an important voice in this area because honestly there's not enough people doing and educating the way that you are and I am really glad that I've come across you and for anybody listening how can they find your work is it best to find you on Instagram do you have TikTok or is yeah it yeah I mean I start off on TikTok so I basically repost my TikToks on Instagram but I'm Dr Han Ran on on both Instagram and TikTok and well honestly really you're fun. amazing so oh, please you. keep doing what you're doing and I hope that one day you'll bring out a book or you know do yeah. something something like that so we can hold on to your insights but I just want to say thank you so much for giving up your time today to talk to me yeah, thanks so much for having me thank you so much for listening to today's episode with the one and only Han Ren I am so grateful that I came across her work on Instagram and I really really do hope that you'll follow her too you can find her at at Dr. Han Ren on Instagram and I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Thank you again for listening and for following along and I hope to see you next time.